بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Continue with our journey through Hassan al-Muslim We're in the section talking about the adhan and the adhan and the adhkar pertaining to that So we have now with us one more to take in this section talking about the adhan and the iqam etc The Prophet or the author he mentions يَدْعُوا لِنَفْسِهِ بَيْنَ الْأَذَانِ وَالْإِقَامَةِ فَإِنَّ الدُّعَاءَ حِينَ إِذٍ لَا يُرَدْ that the person, when the adhan has been made, so between the adhan and the iqama, the person should make dua for themselves, for in this time, the dua is not going to be rejected, inshallah. And we have the hadith which confirms this, the hadith narrated by Imam Tirmidhi, where Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu, he reports from the Prophet sallallahu al-dua la yurad bayna al-adhan wal iqama that the dua between the adhan and the iqama is not rejected right it's answered by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qalu they said famada naqulu ya rasulullah the companions upon hearing this from the prophet sallallahu alaihi they said what should we say o messenger of Allah he said qal sallallahu al-'afiyata fi dunya wal akhirah ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for al afia in the dunya and the akhirah so First and foremost, the thing that we take from this is that those of us who are praying in the masjid, we should get to the masjid early. Why? We want to get to the masjid early so that we can benefit from this time between the adhan and the iqama. And also getting to the masjid early has great benefits. You can pray the sunnah, you can sit there and make dua to Allah Azawajal, you prepare your mind and your soul for the salah which is about to be established. As opposed to the one who gets to the masjid late and the person is rushing, and by the time they've gotten to the salah, it takes them at least the first three raka'ah to calm down and to get in, in touch with what they're actually doing, to be mindful of what they're actually doing. So when you get to the masjid early, you have time to become mindful of the act of worship which you are about to embark upon. And you have time to make dua between the adhan and the iqamah, which is the shahid, which is the point that we are trying to make here. And it's a blessed time. So the Prophet ﷺ guides us to make dua between adhan and iqama, and the believer is always excited to know that there are times which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen or determined wherein that the believer will have his or her duas answered. So this excites the believer because the believer loves to make dua to Allah azawajal, knowing that all good is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing that all good is from Allah Azawajal and Allah loves to give good to his slaves who call upon him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So like the business person in this world or the person seeking the dunya, when they know that they can make a quick profit, when they know that they can embark upon a trade that is going to be easy for them and it's going to be you know um, profitable for them in this period of time, they'll make all the effort that they can for that particular trade to be profitable. For example, you find people when they, the sales are on, the sales are on for a short period of time, however they'll queue up for hours before the sales actually start, hoping to benefit from that time where the sales are on. And we as believers, we have to have something like this when it comes to the times wherein Allah Azawajal and the Prophet ﷺ have told us that these particular times, your dua is more likely to be answered, right? So in these times we should be excited to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing that He has gifted that to us certain times and certain places where the dua is more likely to be answered. Uh, so the Prophet ﷺ said between the adhan and the iqama, a question that be, to be discussed is, is this also applicable to the sisters, to the women who don't pray in the masajid, and other people even who don't pray in the masajid for a, for a valid reason? And the answer is yes. Inshallah, we hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this time is also blessed for them. However, this time for them is from after the adhan has taken place till the time they start their fard salah, right? So for example, the person can go ahead and pray their sunnahs and they can go ahead and do whatever they're doing in the house or the workplace. And then if there's time left between the time of the adhan and the time of the actual fard prayer, then that is the time that they would spend making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As mentioned by Sheikh Sa'd al-Khathlan, in his uh, explanation to this question when it was asked. So also the women who are not praying in the masajid, they can also benefit from the dua between the adhan and the iqama, inshallah. And the iqama for them will be the time when they establish their obligatory prayer, okay? 
So the hadith says لا يرد that the dua is not rejected إذا تحققت فيه أسباب الإجابة وانتفت الموانع So as the scholars they say if the if the uh, the causes for the dua to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are established right the causes for the dua to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are established like you have iman you have taqwa uh, you're upon wudu you're facing the qibla and other matters when tafat al and the things which prevent one from having the dua established are removed qala tibi rahimullah the scholar Atibi he said لا يرد بينهما لشرف ذلك الوقت that the dua between the adhan and the iqama is not rejected due to the honor and the specialness uh, due to the honor and the nobility of this time between the adhan and the iqama وإذا كان الوقت أشرف كان ثواب العبادة فيه أكثر and the more that the time is designated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have value and honor then the more the act of worship in that time is rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the point being that in this time, inshallah by the permission of Allah, when the person makes dua between the adhan and the qama, then it's not going to be rejected. However, there are time there is there are cases that people do make dua in the times which they know to be virtuous, like between the adhan and the qama. However, their du'as are still not accepted. Why is that the case? It could be number one that they are involved in major sins and as we know major sins they prevent one's du'as at times from being answered it could be the case that yes Allah will even answer the du'a of a sinner however it's something that we need to be careful that if we are in major sins it's likely that our du'as are not going to be answered as mentioned in the hadith alluded to the hadith in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet وسلم, in part of it ذكر الرجل يطيل الصفر أشعث أغبث يَمُضُّ يَدَيْهِ لَسَمَاءِ يَقُولْ يَا رَبْ يَا رَبْ So the Prophet Sallallahu in this hadith, in the part of the hadith, in Sahih Muslim, he mentioned a person on a journey. So when a person is traveling, we know that this is one of the causes for your dua to be answered, right? The person who is traveling, it's one of the times when the dua is going to be answers, answered. أَشْعَثْ أَغْبَرْ So this person, his hair is all disheveled and he's covered in dust due to the hardship of that journey. يَمُدُّ يَدَيْ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ And he raises his hands to the heavens when making the dua. And raising your hands is also one of the reasons that help your dua to be answered. And he says, يَا رَبْ يَا رَبْ He calls upon Allah with tawheed. Tawheed al-Rububiyya. And this is also a way to help your dua to be answered. So three things are there. He's traveling. He's raising his hands. And he's calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in tawheed. يَا رَبْ يَا رَبْ Then the Prophet ﷺ says, وَمَطْعَمُهُ حَرَامْ وَمَشْرَبُهُ حَرَامْ وَغُذِيَ بِالْحَرَامِ فَأَنَّ يُسْتَجَابَ لَهُ That the Prophet ﷺ said, even though these three things are there that would, would likely help his dua to be answered, however, his food is gotten from haram sources, his drinking is gotten from haram sources, and his malbas, his clothing is from haram sources, وَغُذِيَ بِالْحَرَامِ And in general, his nourishment and his livelihood is from haram sources. So how is it going to be then that his dua will be answered, the Prophet ﷺ said. So this is imperative, imperative for us to remember that one of the things that prevent us maybe and that we should be scared of from having our duas prevented from being answered is falling into major sins, right? Another reason why the dua may not be answered even though you are making dua in these special blessed times or, and places is that maybe it's the case that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is choosing for you something better than what you are making dua for, right? So maybe it's the case that you're making dua to be married to a particular woman or to a particular man. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not allowing this to happen because he knows that that person is going to be bad for you. So the delay in the response is due to a wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and you do not know. Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun as Allah azza wa jal says. Allah knows and you do not know. So whenever the dua, the response to the dua is being delayed, as long as we are upon obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal, we should be happy knowing that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is going to choose for us that which is best. Another reason as to why the dua may be delayed in answering is because maybe Allah Subhanahu wa Taala loves hearing you call upon Him, and He loves that you are getting closer to Him by making this dua. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala delays the response of your dua because He wants to hear your voice calling upon Him with humility and devotion. 
And there's many other reasons as to why the dua may not be answered, but in all cases, the person doesn't lose out when making dua because dua is an act of worship that is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَالَ رَبَّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Your Lord says, call upon me and I will make dua to you and I will answer your duas. Right? And the Prophet sallallahu said in the hadith in Tirmidhi, الدُّعَى هُوَ الْإِبَادَةِ that dua, it is the reality of an act of it, it is the reality of worship, because you are humbling yourself before Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. You are admitting to Allah that you are in complete poverty and in complete need of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So when one acknowledges this, this brings them closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and they experience sweetness in the acts of worship that they are doing, which is the dua. So we always remember that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is completely generous, completely rich and that we should make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often and we should never be despondent or despair if our duas are not being answered and we should recognize that it's upon us to change our state to become closer to Allah through doing more obedience and through seeking forgiveness and to recognize that whatever Allah Azawajal is choosing for us if we are on a state upon a state of obedience then it's going to be good for us so we, sh we should never despair and in the hadith they asked him, so what should we say, O Messenger of Allah? The Prophet ﷺ said, Sallallahu al akhirah Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for al-afiyah in the dunya and the akhirah. Al-afiyah bi ma'na, al-afiyah bi ma'na as-salama min al-afat al-diniyya wa dunyawiyya. Ay, an yuslam al-insanu fi badnihi wa an yuslima fi dinihi. This word al-afiyah, it's a very comprehensive term. It basically means that you are free from any harms and defects that may befall you in this worldly life or befall you upon your religion. So it's a very comprehensive word which is covering every situation that you may find yourself trying to run away from. Of course that's what we're doing in life, we're trying to run away from that which is harmful and we're trying to run away, run towards that which is beneficial. So this is the word Al-Afiyah, we ask Allah for Al-Afiyah in the dunya and the akhirah, meaning that Allah put us in a state and make us remain in a state which is free from all harms and shortcomings and bringing only that which is full of blessings to us and full of goodness, whether it be in our worldly life or whether it be pertaining to our dunya, our dini affairs, our religious affairs the acts of worship which will bring us to safety in the hereafter inshallah so we ask allah for al-afiyah in the dunya and the akhirah well state of well-being in this life and in the next ameen طيب, then we move on after having spoken about the um, duas and the adhkar pertaining to the uh, to the adhan we move on now and we start the new section wherein the author he brings forth duas and adhkar pertaining to the prayer itself. So we start with the du'as which is known as istiftah al-salah. Okay, al-adiyya al-istiftah. The du'as which are pertaining to the opening of the salah. The du'as you say in the beginning of the salah. So one of them as narrated in Sahih Muslim from Abu Harir radiallahu anhu where he said قَالْ كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا كَبَّرَ فِي الصَّلَاةِ سَكَتَ هُنَيَّةً قَبْلَ أَنْ يَقْرَأَ that the Prophet وسلم, when he would stand in the prayer and he would make the takbir after takbir it would be noticed that he would be silent for a short period of time before he started to read the salah before he started to read Surah Al-Fatiha فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ بِأَبِي أَنْتَ وَأُمِّي أَرَأَيْتَ سَكُوتُكَ بَيْنَ تَكْبِيرِ وَالْقِرَاءَ So Abu Huraira he said O oh, Messenger of Allah وسلم, may my father and mother be sacrificed for you you know that time that you are silent after the takbir and before you start the recitation in the salah ma taqul what do you say so the prophet sallallahu said aqulu i say allahumma ba'id bayni wa bayna khatayaya oh allah distance me or oh, i'll read the dua and will will uh, translate it and explain it word by word in a bit inshallah allahumma ba'id bayni wa bayna khatayaya كما بعدت البين المشرق والمغرب اللهم نقني من خطاياي كما ينقى الثوب الأبيض من الدنس اللهم اللهم اخزني من خطاياي بالماء وبالثلج والماء والبرد. Okay, so this is the narration where Abu Hurairah narrates that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is silent after having said the takbir, after having said Allahu Akbar, and before this, before he starts the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha. So Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu being the king, keen companion as many of the companions were 
they would notice every single detail about the Prophet ﷺ. And they noticed that at this point, the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't say anything in the Salah. He would remain silent. So they asked the Prophet ﷺ, what is it that you are doing at that point? And this is the beauty of the companions radiallahu anhum, that they never left out anything which was beneficial to them and of course beneficial to us because they are the ones who narrated the deen to us from the Prophet sallallahu So an important point here is, is that if the prophets, if the companions radiallahu anhum didn't narrate to us from the Prophet sallallahu that he did such and such, or they themselves didn't do such and such, then we should not do it. Right? If we find that an action was not done by the companions عنهم, or it was not narrated to us from the companions in an authentic manner then we shouldn't do it because the deen is completed at the time of the Prophet وسلم, and at the time of the companions and there is nothing that would benefit us or bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except that the companions told us about it and nothing that would keep us away from the pleasure of Allah جل, except that the companions told us about it upon the tongue of the Prophet so then, we say that Allah, the Prophet ﷺ, he said in the narration, Allahumma ba'it bayni wa bayna khataya, ya oh Allah, distance me. So the Prophet ﷺ in this dua is Allah asking Allah for distance between him and the sins that one may fall into. والمراد من مباعدة محوما مضى من الذنوب السابقة وعدم الوقوع في ذنوب اللاحقة. And the intent for this word, oh Allah, distance me, Allahumma ba'id, Allahumma ba'idni. Oh Allah keep me distant is that the intent is that you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove from you the effect of the previous sins that you may have fallen into and to keep you away from any future sins that you may fall into Allahumma ba'idni bayni wa bayna khataya Allahumma ba'id bayni wa bayna khataya Oh Allah distance me from my sins and my mistakes right distance me from the effects of my sins and the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may fall upon me due to these sins and prevent me from falling into any future sins. كَمَا بَعَدْتَ بَيْنَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ As you have distance between the east and the west, right? Imam Sana'ani, he mentions here that look at the words that have been chosen. As you have distance between the east and the west, keep me so far away from my mistakes and the effects of my mistakes and falling into any future mistakes like you have kept the east distant from the west and also like the east and the west they cannot join they cannot touch likewise keep us away from ever joining or touching any sins that may come across our path in the future so it's a complete begging of Allah to stay completely far away and free from sins as much as possible Allahumma naqqini and then the person says Allahumma naqqini oh Allah purify me wa huwa majaz an izwali dhunub wa mahwi atharihah and it is relating to be purified from the sins and the effects of the sins min khatayaya okay you say allahumma ba'idni allahumma ba'id bayni wa bayna khatayaya allahumma naqqini min khatayaya oh allah purify me from my sins as in one of the narrations min khatayaya what is this word min khatayaya mean imam atibi he says rahimullah al khitaya al saghair khitaya means the the minor sins so you're saying allah purify me from my minor sins. Allahumma naqqini min khatayaya. Sometimes we take it easy with regards to the small sins because we think that, okay, it's only a minor sin, it's not gonna have much of a problem or much of an effect. But we need to remind ourselves that mountains are made from stones. So each time the small sin is committed, it leads, leaves a black dot on our heart as mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu until may Allah preserve us and protect us it could be the case that somebody so often committing the small sins and so many of them that it ends up covering the heart in blackness wherein the person is in then a very serious situation pertaining to the Iman and also it's never the way of the righteous that they take small sins lightly because they know as mentioned by Abdullah bin Masudin radiallahu anhu in Tirmidhi, that he, Abdullah ibn Masood, radiyallahu anhu, said, إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنْ يَرَى ذَنْبَهُ كَأَنَّهُ ذُنُوبَهُ كَأَنَّهُ فِي أَصْلِ الْجَبِنْ يَخَافُ أَنْ يَقَعَ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنْ يَرَى ذُنُوبَهُ كَأَنَّهُ فِي أَصْلِ الْجَبِنْ يَخَافُ أَنْ يَقَعَ عَلَيْهِ That the believer, the true believer, sees their sins as though they are sitting at the bottom of a mountain, and the mountain is about to fall upon them. That's how fearful they are of their sins. وَإِنَّ الْمُنَافِقْ يَرَى ذُنُوبَهُ أَذَنْبَهُ كَأَنَّهُ ذُبَابُ 
وقع على أنفه فقال به هكذا and the munafiq, the hypocrite, the one weak of faith or the one absent of faith he or she sees their sin as though it's just a fly that has landed upon their nose and they just wipe it away yani a sin of no consequence whereas the believer understands that the more they commit these minor sins they could easily lead the person to fall into major sins very likely because the iman gets weaker and weaker the more you commit the minor sins so the true believer is one who is on guard from the minor sins as well as the major sins and seeks forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all كما ينقى الثوب الأبيض من الدنس so after saying اللهم نقني من خطايا يا أو الله purify me from my minor sins like كما ينقى الثوب الأبيض من الدنس like you purify the white thobe from any stains that fall upon it so like a person would purify a white thobe from any stains that fall upon it why was the white color mentioned in clothing because the white color when it has dirt on it the person has to be extra careful to remove the effect of that stain okay it has to be a very thorough removing whereas if it's a dark colored clothing you can leave the effect of the stain and it's not going to be noticed easily so we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove from us our sins in a complete manner which leaves behind no effect or no trace of that sin and then the person says Allah مِغْسِلْنِي مِنْ خَطَايَا يَا بِمَاءِ وَثَلِجُ بَرَدْ O oh Allah purify me and wash me from my sins okay my mistakes like uh, with water and ice and snow okay so why use the uh, words water ice and snow because sins is that which burns sins is that which leads you to the fire so the sins it has the 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 description of being burning because it can burn a person in the hellfire and also it burns away the blessings in this life and it burns away the iman that a person may be on so it's uh, munasib it's appropriate that we are making dua to Allah جل, to remove that which is burning us which is the sins with water ice and snow etc okay and this dua this opening dua that we're discussing dua al-istiftah the opening dua of the salah is appropriate why is it appropriate because now you want your sins to be removed and also you're thinking about the fact that you're going to do an act of worship which is going to remove your sins inshallah by Allah's permission which is the uh, which is the salah itself as mentioned in Sahih Muslim the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said do you not see that if one of you was to have a river in front of their house and the person was to wash in that river five times a day would there be any um, filth left upon that person no O Messenger of Allah no dirt would be left upon that person who washes five times a day in the river which is in front of their house Prophet ﷺ said, likewise, that is the example, the similitude of the one who prays five times a day. Then the person doesn't have any sins, inshallah, the small sins left upon them. So this is something that we need to reflect upon, reflect upon the meanings contained in this beautiful dua that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us far away from our sins, like the distance of the east and the west, and the keep us far away from the effects of those sins. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify us uh, from our sins in the ways which was mentioned in this dua anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the shortcomings and mistakes were for myself and shaitan inshallah we'll see you in the next session inshallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh